Welcome everybody to the IFTA screen discussion series, putting focus on each of the feature films submitted for this year's IFTA awards. Every week we're going to be putting the spotlight on a variety of diverse feature projects representing the best of Irish filmmaking. And today I'm delighted to be joined by the filmmakers and uh, lead actor of the Pride of Grania Whale. Um, this is Donald Foreman's follow-up to his acclaimed features Out of Here and The Image You Missed, and it's been selected for the Dublin International Film Festival, the Galway Film Flat, Belfast Film Festival, Buenos Aires Cinema Festival, and Porto Postdoc. It's in consideration for the 2023 IFTA Awards in a number of categories, and I'm delighted we're joined today by writer-director Donald Foreman, actor Judith Roddy, composers Nick Roth, and Olesia Zorovetska and sound designer Simon Bird. Um, thank you so much for all joining us today. Um, so Donald, I'll start with you. Uh, your previous narrative feature out of here was focused on a young man's relationship to Ireland and the urban space of Dublin. Uh, and this film, The Cry of Grania Whale, is obviously exploring how two women develop a very strong attachment to the stories of rural space. Um, is there something common in how you want to depict how the Irish environment affects people and challenges them creatively? Um, I guess I wasn't thinking about a conscious connection, but I'm sure there are um, similarities. And I suppose I always get excited and often the starting place for me is wanting to like explore a particular place and then using the frame of like a character's journey to uh to explore that and i guess i'm naturally drawn to characters who are, who are somehow outside of or estranged to that world and can kind of give you a different um perspective on it but I guess the big differences out of here was um, a film that was like very much uh, drawn from the experiences of myself and my friends and people I knew growing up in Dublin um, that uh, so it was kind of not that it was not that it was autobiographical but it was all it was very much connected to this world that that I was a part of that I was that I had grown up in um and trying to sort of capture Dublin at a particular uh particular time um whereas I traveled around the places in the west of Ireland that we where we shot the cry of Grania Whale but um I didn't know them that well and I was always very much a tourist in those places and then the the sort of story and the characters was something that was much more uh, you know, we just made it up. So, um, so that made it a different kind of, uh, yeah, feel like a very different kind of project. Mm -hmm. And where exactly was it that you shot the bulk of the film? Um, so we shot a few days uh, in Dublin for the start of the film, and then we were uh, on Ackle Island and Clare Island, and, and in Lewisburg for a day or two for the the Grania Whale Heritage Museum they have there. Oh, brilliant, okay. Yeah, mainly Ackle and Clare. Great. You mentioned there about having a, a person who's sort of maybe a bit, feels a bit out of place. And you have this character, Moira, who's played by Dale Dickey, who's fantastic in the film. And she's got such a unique energy where I guess she's this like American artist. She's not familiar with the Irish territory. Um, she comes into the space and she's sort of like, totally kind of her energy clashes with what's around her, but also it kind of works with it. Um, and she, I guess, develops this attachment to the, the Grania Whale mythology that kind of exists in the space. Um, so when you were casting this role and when you found Dale for the role, what were you looking for in particular? Um, I guess, yeah, I wanted, uh, I knew I wanted someone who could kind of walk walk the line between um that you uh, you would kind of keep changing your mind about her she wasn't quite one thing or another because i think there's like there's a there's been a lot of american and ireland stories it's almost its own little um genre and that can veer either either towards 
a sort of romanticized American perspective or a very cynical Irish perspective. Um, and I wanted a character who was on one level, she has these annoying American qualities and is kind of just like walking around in this very brash way, but she also has a real uh, energy and vibrancy that actually kind of brings something out of people and they're sort of you can't really separate um the two and um yeah dale was um the first the first person i thought of asking to play the part and it's quite different to a lot of the um parts she's played in the past she tends to play a lot of kind of like tougher you know southern um roles in the states but i knew when i'm casting i like uh I like to try to find like podcasts or interviews with the actors and um, I listened to a podcast with Dale and I, I heard kind of some other qualities in her that I thought that that she, she has kind of uh, other aspects that she doesn't get to explore in films mm -hmm. so much that we could kind of play with. So, yeah. And once you, once you met her after you'd cast her, I guess, and started working with her, did she contribute a lot to the development of the character or did it remain more so as you had it written down on, in the script initially? Um, yeah, no, um, all the actors um, contributed a lot, especially Dale and Judith, because we had a two-week a two uh, rehearsal process prior to the film. And I went into that with, with an outline of the film that was... Uh, detailed up to a point but didn't have dialogue and the latter part of the film was a little more um open in terms of what it would be and so in the rehearsals we improvised scenes and tried things out and I would go home and write scenes and we do them the next day so um there was a lot of dialogue and back and forth and we really kind of uh developed it together so um I definitely wanted the actors to to bring a lot of their own ideas um to the part and that's yeah dale and Great. judith we did that so judith you provide a really compelling contrast to dale's character mm -hmm. um Koch is much much more kind of academic and is a bit cautious mm -hmm. and dale is so kind of wild in her performance when they first start traveling around together and, and Koch is is more is more cautious for sure. So did you and Dale sort of collaborate when you got to rehearse or when you first met her and trying to find a good balance between the two characters and sort of allow the film to show us every angle of how the interest in this space and in the mythology of Grania Whale can grow in different types of people? We did, yeah. As Donald said, you know, it was um we sort of got together and had a bit of a a play, a bit of a rehearsal in a, in a, a way that, that's mm -hmm. kind of theatrical. We have that time and space to, to do a bit of development, to do a bit of chat, go away, reflect on it, come back, see what sits, see what you want to, what fat you want to cut away, you know, and largely because of the way it was being shot as well, you know, because it's 16 millimeter, there's no, everyone has to come together. Mm -hmm. it, it, it felt like a company. Um, Try to utilize the time in the you know in, in the most economic way, just you know purely because there's not money lost. But I think coming from a character perspective with myself and Dale, it's definitely not something conscious when you're coming together. I'm gonna fill in the gaps that you don't have in your character, or we're gonna try and contrast. Or I think once you try and um, once you're trying, I think you're. <laughs> You're putting a nail in your own performance and that you know it's just what um what you find in each other and naturally i think um there was an absence um in both these people and whatever it was they found in each other and i think there's something with mythology as well because it it is i mean it's a it's a it's an eternal living thing but essentially it's a reclaim of the past or a reflection or it's not to make these things present as a you know sort of constant investigation so and then it really is the the gem parts of Ireland that bring it to life these locations you know which really um, do affect the characters and the mood and when you spend like Dona was saying you know you're you're a tourist in these places until until you're not until you're sitting with 
the same family that live in Clare Island and have been there their whole life. And then all of a sudden you start to feel the fabric of a place and, um, and how people live and their dynamics. And, and then just the landscape starts to inform you as well, as much as we're informing each other, which is not something that you decide. It just, um, it just arrives, hopefully, you know. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Donald. The the she mentioned there the sixteen millimeter that the film was shot on, and it obviously looks so unique and and looks incredible, and was shot by Diana Vidrascu, um, who did an amazing job. And uh, she Judith mentioned the the challenges, I guess, of of the expense of shooting on a film stock like that. So, to what extent did you feel like it provided you with with like it, it put you in a box of what you were doing shooting, but also gave you opportunity in terms of the, the limits of working on that format. Um, yeah, it definitely, um, it was, it, it created practical difficulties, especially because of where we were shooting. Um, and, uh, it was, and then it also created a real discipline, which in my mind, it's hard to separate from the discipline of, of just a low budget shoot in general because we had 20 days to to do the film and it, uh, my first feature was 20 days as well i'm kind of used to having to work uh under those constraints and so having that rehearsal time in advance where you can where you can as judith says kind of play and think it through um really helps to then when you get to the shoot that you're you're able to kind of you develop a certain shorthand about things and you're able to just um, work through it. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, it adds a certain energy and focus for everyone involved. I know um, for a lot of the crew we had on set, we had, um, we had some really experienced crew members who've been like, you know, working on films since the eighties. And for them, it was, I think it was really exciting because they, they get to work on film so rarely now and they have a real um respect for for that process so uh um yeah i think that was uh it was a privilege really to be mm -hmm. able to do that. and when you chose to shoot it like that was was the intent i suppose to evoke some of the sort of mysticism that that is so thematically central to the film because i guess it gives the film this this kind of dreamlike quality which lines up with what everyone is talking about, which is this old myth of Grania Whale and these, these kind of ancient fables that everyone is so interested in. Yeah, I think there is something with digital when it comes to like uh, capturing older time periods or, or giving a sense of ancient, there's something about the digital that just, I, I find it hard to get, to get into when it's like, mm -hmm. you know, medieval times on the Ari Alexa or whatever. But um, originally, I I thought that uh, you know there's there's the film that Dale's character is shooting within the film, and I always thought that would be on film because she's this uh, kind of underground filmmaker uh, coming from New York, and I thought that's her world and that's how she would have um, approach it. Uh, and then at first I thought the rest of the film would be digital as a contrast, but as I was going along, I realized I didn't want there to be a clear line between her film and the film we're watching. And as it goes on, part of the progression is that those lines really blur and you start to wonder, you know, whose film are we watching? Um, so, uh, so for that reason, it really helped uh, to have that kind of consistent filmic quality. Great. The film, obviously, as amazing as it looks, it also sounds fantastic. Um, we have we have three people here who, who know a lot about, about how the film sounds. So Simon, first to you, as a, as someone who works in, in sound of films, it must be really exciting to have a film that takes place largely outside in natural locations. There's so much sound of water, the sound of, of, of natural life taking place kind of while these characters are, are living this, this journey. And uh, did you find it kind of extra complicated compared to other projects you might have worked on or was it just exciting to have so much audio space to play around in I guess um I think definitely the latter I mean uh when I first saw the initial cut of the film um 
the thing that struck me right away was uh, just how much of it takes place in kind of these open spaces um, in exterior shots, like you said, and all these sequences where you're on these kind of like rugged coastlines. You can see the characters kind of like hair flying in the wind and the waves crashing. And I just think there's like so much variety in those soundscapes that I really wanted to kind of make sure that they were accurately represented in the film and that um, you really felt like you were there. And um, even when the film is at its kind of more surreal moments, I think the um, the score does such a good job of kind of taking you into those kind of more dreamlike and um, kind of uh, surreal moments that I think the, uh, the the role of the sound design was just to kind of create that texture that roots you in the location, regardless of what's happening in the story. But um, yeah, I just think, like you said, um, it was just, there were so many kind of um, different locations and variety and textures in there that I just, um, that was what excited me, I suppose. Fantastic. And to Alessia and Nick, um, had you guys ever worked together on a on a score before this film? Uh, well, well, we're husband and wife, so okay, <laughs> explains that. We have well, collaborated that's... on a number of projects, but this is a, a first feature. I know. I was just mentioning mm. that it was certain serendipity in this because uh, we were just talking about working together, and then two days later. Um, Donald contacted us and offered this uh, to work to work on it, uh, on this great film. I, yeah. I think it's interesting, specifically in terms of place, um, because when we made the score, we were in pretty much kind of deepest, darkest lockdown moments. So we never actually got to go to any of the the places. Um, and, and it's really important for me, usually in most pro most projects, to be in a place to kind of absorb the atmosphere. I mean, I'm, I'm here in Tangier in the hotel where William Burroughs oh. taking lunch because we're working on a beat project. But the funny thing with this is it was kind of in reverse uh, because after the film, by another coincidence, both Alessa and I went to Clare Island uh, to do a collaboration with the weaver, Beth Morn. Uh, for the 300 year anniversary of the Linen Hall. Um, and Beth had kind of hosted a, a lot of the crew. So she was also kind of involved with them. I mean, it's a tiny place. There's 150 people on the island. So everyone knew obviously what was happening. Um, but we knew the whole island from the film. I mean, we were walking around and we were like, that's Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was so bizarre, actually. Yeah. So it's strange. Yeah, we've been looking at, at, at these amazing shots of the landscape for months. Um, and so suddenly to go there in reverse was kind of this this opposite process. Um, but but still, I think even through the screen, uh, the place was still very much inspirational for the music. Um, you know, and and certain kind of triggers. I mean, when you're writing music, you're always looking for these kind of trigger words. And you know, the, like Donald mentioned the keen or the idea of of a keen in the background, and that kind of triggered this whole journey into Eileen Dovney Connell's uh, Lament of Otto Leary. Um, which is also another connection to Bob Quinn, you know, he's a good friend of ours, he's also in the film. Uh, and, and so that was a, a, a big thread that kind of ran through it, that kind of goes in and out the landscape. It's obviously such an, an important text. And obviously, uh, McConnell, who's Daniel O'Connell's uh, grandmother, I think, or great aunt, um, but was one of the, the great kind of Irish epic poets, you know, of her age, certainly oral poets. Um, so in a way, it's a kind of a Grony Whale-esque figure as well within, within Irish literature. Um, so it was, it was very much about threads and, and place, you know, that the music was kind of woven from. Yeah, and actually, since you asked uh, if, if it worked together with Nick, that was, um, I think, a very good decision for this film because uh, um, Donald was quite clear, which is, uh, from my experience, working uh creating music for film. And I worked with uh, Ukrainian, because I'm Ukrainian and um, Eastern European uh, filmmakers before. And uh, it was actually great to work uh, sort of with Donald and get a sense of like, you know, uh, the very, something very Irish about it for me, of course. Uh, but he was very clear since the beginning of, of sort of music he wanted to. And that was a 
like it was an abundance of music, I must say, from like, you know, post punk to the skin that I actually, it was great because I, um, you know, had time to immerse into this whole uh, world and research uh, that and learn, you know, the, the right pronunciation and style of singing. And we recorded many, many versions of it, uh, the skin that Nick wrote and sort of, it, it was quite, uh, you know, it, I don't know the English word, en enriching. It was uh, sort of, I learned a lot of new things, you know, working on this. But yeah, because of, of, of very, it was very vast uh, sort of soundscape from orchestral uh, scenes to Baroque to sort of this quite abstract, uh, you know, avant-garde, free jazz sort of sounds. It was great because we split with Nick and like, okay, you're going to work on this and I'm going to work on this. We have, you know, we, did, we were not short with time with this but but like you know we just uh, we, we were working so closely with Donald kind of articulating uh, each other what we were thinking about the scenes and kind of discussing and kind of immersing into that which which was great and um, yeah it was uh, it was good to, to to split the responsibility and and sort of make sure we get everything in time and uh, get everything right, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was great. great. Something that I'd say was enjoyable for all of you as, as actors, composers, and obviously as a, as a director, Donal, is, is how we get to see the film within the film and we get to see what Dale's character is making. Um, and in terms of the score, it kind of shifts a bit. Um, when we're when we're watching the film within the film, definitely the look of the film changes quite a bit in terms of like the, the we get the grayscale, we get some other use of color. Um, so I guess question kind of open to, to anyone is, 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 did you try and dis distinguish the film within the film that, that, that the character was directing from the, the film we were watching? Um, or did you, Donald, intentionally, as you said, want there to be a bit of a blur of whose film are we watching? And did that impact sort of your performance, Judith, when you're sort of being shot by Dale's <laughs> character in costume or when, um, when you guys were doing the score, right? It's open to anyone, I guess. I think that there's just a really generous thing when there's, you know, the language, the language of costume can do so much without with you having to do so little. And Maeve mm -hmm. Patterson really looked after everything so well. And there was a very distinct change once we were in the film, within the film, mm -hmm. sort of uh, aesthetically with the costumes. And obviously at that stage, we, we couldn't hear, you know, the music that was added out. It was so wonderful to hear that afterwards. But you know these things will come into place, but certainly visually, the aesthetic of the very distinct change of costume, because I was very straight laced and um, a sort of confined person. Um, there was a certain kind of liberation and st just storytelling through the literal fabric of what I was wearing, you know, so, you know, it's that type of thing. Um, it's just so incredibly helpful and made was brilliant, you know. Yeah, I think musically there's there's a pretty clear split in in all of the material until the end. Um, you know, the, the the orchestral suite is in seven movements. The first film within the film actually is is uh, Donald's kind of archival footage um, from from New York, which is this post punk thing. That's very distinct, and that only happens there. Um, and then the the baroque music is the first, and and that has the heart, kind of harpsichord stuff. That's when the first fir film comes in first, and and it's quite kind of you know twee almost, you know, um, and it's uh, it's at the very end, like in the last few minutes of of the film, that there's this sudden collapsing of the borders, mm -hmm. and the orchestral music kind of creeps into the film, and suddenly that film is the film. Um, so I, I would say the music is kind of in in parallel straights. And then they kind of swoops together in this kind of waterfall in, in the last moment. Yeah, and it was kind of a sense of that, for me, it was certainly that sense of a vertigo of a history that you're dealing here with, you know, the sense of like those psychological relationship with people. But parts of it is purely like a road movie, <laughs> like, you know, and I had to do this really <laughs> minimal, minimal zither soundscape. And I really love that sort of... Um, I, I don't know, it was again the right English word, the bravery around it to sort of to, to go for, for, for this type of edit, you know, and like suddenly we're transitioning into a whole entire different world in someone's head or in inside of this kind of, you know, so so that was pretty cool. I actually never had the chance to tell you this, Donald, in person. Well, there you go. 
Um, I wanted to add about the music as well that, so when I began editing, I was using um, uh, mostly like temp tracks from other, uh, uh, from other films or just pieces of music that I, um, that kind of related to the feel that I wanted. And there was also, uh, there was, you know, several uh, songs in the background of scenes or different things where I thought like, well, maybe I'll try to get the rights for a song to this or that. And then um, Nick and Alessia just said like, oh, well, we can do that. We can do that. So um, so it's like, practice, apart from the song at the start, it's like every piece of music in the film was created by um, by them. So you're hearing like a jazzy blues singer in the background of a scene or jazz in another or the post-punk thing. So um just the like versatility and range that they were able to bring to it was really amazing and also like <clears throat> you pretty much everything you recorded in your house right yeah, yeah we have a nice studio at home yeah everything um, yeah and and mostly uh, it's us playing all the instruments so i mean there, there are a couple of favors that, that we pulled in you know people whose records we played on and we were like would you mind playing on this or you know less yeah the orchestral <laughs> scene we had to you know ask our wonderful uh string musician friends like Kate actually, Ellis and actually uh, you know two, two or three of them lived in the house as well <laughs> <laughs> in other rooms but, but to um, create that like orchestral sound just you know musician by musician like recording in your hair I was really amazed by that well, these things happen if you sort of, as you as you mentioned, if you don't have extensive budgets, etc. Obviously, preferable uh, work conditions are going to the studio, bringing a score to to the orchestra, and they just, you know, and recording it in a few hours. But I must say, it, it was so much fun, and because it was a lot like really dark, deep lockdown time, <laughs> we had so much fun with this. Was it for you, Donal, like some uh, for, in terms of the post-punk stuff that we see, was it like a bit of a dream come true for you to put yourself in the role of a filmmaker like this character and get to like use some of that footage and put some music on top of it and sort of inhabit that period of filmmaking and that that era a little bit? Yeah, I mean, and that was one of the kind of fun things about the film as a whole really was because the film dips in and out of these different styles and the overall style of the film transforms so much that you get to kind of just play around with these different uh these different kinds of uh like grammars and tones and and um that was a lot of fun and um in terms of uh the the sound design as well i think i've always thought you know I made like I made several films that where there wasn't a lot of music and I and I kind of kind of came I've kind of often approached films thinking like how can you use the sound design as if it was the score without without you noticing it in a way but mm -hmm. that you're thinking of like um, different atmospheric sounds or things that can have a kind of musical or emotional effect that's like almost um subliminal so um so we just had such a wide range of tools to kind of play with that and be expressive and um simon really uh brought a lot of ingenuity to kind of filling that out um from from the kind of bare sounds that we had from production um into this like rich um soundscape and yeah so being able to have that and the music and everything together was a real treat mm -hmm. for you I simon think... were there sorry you were just no no were there particular just... references or influences that donald sort of passed on to you in terms of what work you wanted you to achieve here um well we had we had quite a, a lot of kind of discussion about um sort of certain moods you wanted to kind of get in in the different environments but uh, to be honest with you i mean so much of it was just in the picture i mean like all of those kind of different sound textures and um, how like those evocative elements, like the different types of water and like wind and all, like foliage and even just some of the kind of room tones. I think um, it was all in the picture. And I, I think I was just feeding off of that. But um, there was I like, there was, was few, sorry, uh, I think there was like a few things like there's this, uh, the, this kind of uh, mysterious cave space at the start of the film that we mm. returned to a few times that I had like 
that I knew I wanted a kind of specific sound for, but I didn't quite know what it was. So there was some things like that where I know we spent a lot, like I think there was 10 different tracks or something of different yeah. like <laughs> drips and winds and waves and everything that we were like playing around with. So both Simon and really everyone here, I, I uh, uh, really deserves an award for patience for dealing with my kind of obsessiveness about a lot of these details. I think it's cool the way you get this like talent obsessed, you know, that it starts with, I, with an idea and then you get the first iteration and then it evolves and then change. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I think for that post punk scene, you meant you said no wave or something like that. There was like kind of a no wave thing. And so the immediate association was Vivian Dick. So we actually made a whole kind of track using a, a text from a Vivian Dick catalog uh, that, that she sent me. And, um, you know, and then that kind of got gradually broken apart and morphed. And in the end, it's kind of like this uh, detritus of, of that track is what you get. But that's that's cool, you know, the, the process. And I'm, I'm sure it was a similar thing in, in the acting as well. You, you get this kind of initial idea and then it evolves and it evolves. And what you end up at, at the end is kind of the, you know, the, the edges of that. Mm -hmm. I must say for the, oh, sorry, yeah. didn't want to interrupt anyone, but just to quickly add something small that the actors' voices, well, apart from, of course, incredible acting, I enjoyed so much just seeing you guys there and, you know, many, many times, but just the, the timbres of voices, that's something as well that was quite, um, that, that I was kind of thinking in the context of what's happening quite a lot. And um, yeah, it just sounds just it's just i think it was such a such a great cast uh, sort of uh you know team crew like a really powerful cast yeah. back to you judith your your character has such a personal relationship with this mm -hmm. this landscape and with the grania mm -hmm. wales story um did you have your own relationship with that mythology before you got the part or did you do a lot of research as you were preparing we were researching as we were preparing but i think the big gift in it was, I mean, it's so unusual to do uh, a narration over the picture. And um, I've only ever done that in documentaries, which I love, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a different, it's a different thing. Um, and there's lots of choices to be made there. And when you're making those choices in an ADR session, um, looking at the picture, it is more like making a soundscape. It is more, you're trying to fit in. I mean, apart from the fact that we all know, you know, an ADR session is, it can be so long after the fact. And yeah, it's a sort of recollection of memory of what, what you did and where you were and a celebration of it. And also, a, what's that? Where was this? Um, but yeah, just to try and um, gather, gather the right, uh, Activeness, reflectiveness, um, you know, you don't want to, yeah, you don't want to make it a, a you know, a, a storybook, you know, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a live thing. So it is a very particular, it's a particular thing. And it's always, you know, to make it as personal as possible. So I think a lot of that was solidified and that sort of personal narration then afterwards which was really really helpful to do you know right. because I can you know it's I, 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 I'm not a huge fan of going over your own work and having a look but I think you can tell what's happening in your eyes even if you can't remember it at that, at that point so you can amplify or add something hopefully to it mm -hmm. with the generosity of an uh, you know the opportunity to narrate which is helpful, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was all, that was almost that was a whole other production that we had <laughs> yeah. of, of doing because I had like um better part of a day of of doing like voiceover and ADR with um with all the main actors really because they all have their kind of parts mm -hmm. and that was <clears throat> another uh layer in the palimpsest of the kind of sound design was playing around with all those um voices i remember we also um had judith uh sc scream moira's name for us like <laughs> times or something we had 
like so many amazing <laughs> screams to choose from for the for the end of the film. Excellent. Um, so final question before we wrap up, uh, I think a lot of people who'd be watching this discussion and, and IFTA members um, would really enjoy the sort of the, the cameos, I guess, by, by Bob Quinn and by Donald Clark and this whole sequence that takes place in the IFI um, and the whole, I, are you really breaking up with me in the IFI uh, line, which I think is hilarious. Um, this section, obviously, did you kind of primarily put it in the specifics of it? Of, of, of having him host the Q&A or whatever, would they put in sort of create realism around the situation that, oh, this is someone who will be brought to Dublin or or is it just kind of a, a private joke for, for Dublin people who'd be checking out the film? Best man for the part, really. <laughs> um, I, I mean, cause I did, and you know, in my first feature out of here, I had a cast that was a, a real mix of actors and non-actors and I cast people just kind of from around Dublin who I met and thought were interesting. And um, because I knew I knew what that scene was gonna be and that I was kind of fleshing these scenes out in rehearsal. So I thought the, the best way to kind of avoid it feeling just like phony or like a parody of that kind of thing would be to have someone who really knew how to do it so um and like, yeah I thought it would be funny and people would enjoy seeing him as well um and so I asked uh Donald to do it and um I sent him like a biography of the fictional biography of of Dale's character of the filmmaker so he could match the kind of filmmaker it was and then we did like a half hour rehearsal where he interviewed her and I pushed him to be progressively meaner to her um and uh yeah and so that's how we ended up with the scene um and having um Bob Quinn in the film I guess was especially meaningful to me just because of the importance of his work to me and to Irish cinema I think and his you know he made the only other feature film shot on uh Clare Island but Awani with with Donald McCann back in the 80s um, and yeah, there was just a lot of connections between him and the, the work. So, uh, that was, uh, that was special that we were able to have him involved as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. That's, uh, all we have time for. Thank you all so much for joining today. It's been great to hear about the, the making of this fantastic film. And I highly recommend anyone who hasn't got a chance to watch it yet, uh, to, to do so. And um, best of luck with all of you to on your next projects. Um, you. And hopefully uh, the film fares Thank very you. well at the at the IFTA Awards. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. Thanks, Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye bye.